This is episode 210 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Welcome to episode 210 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today, I have Christopher Katendi on the show. And Christopher's an interesting guy. He went from flipping houses and doing larger projects in Toronto to buying trailers. Yes, trailers, not trailer parks, although that's on the works too for him, in Buffalo and surrounding areas in New York State. So Christopher went cross-border when he saw opportunities changing. Right in the middle of the first lockdown, he had his struggles with getting down and checking on his assets. We went through several case studies and stories of how he's been able to make that profitable. He had hit pause for a little while, but more recently he's made several acquisitions and the numbers are actually looking pretty juicy. So we dug into those case studies. This was an extremely unique and extremely interesting episode for me to do. So I hope you enjoy it as well. Just before we jump into the episode, please make sure you like, subscribe, hit the notification bell and leave us a comment if you're enjoying the show. And if you're an audio listener, a favorable review and a five-star rating would be greatly appreciated. Thanks for tuning in as always. Let's jump into episode 210 with Christopher Katen. Hello and welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. I have Christopher Katende on the show all the way from East Toronto in rush hour traffic. So thanks for coming. Thank you for having me, Andrew. Appreciate it. Yeah. So we met at one of the uh, GTA West REI meetups. Yeah. And um, you started telling me about what you're up to. And I'm like, well, you should come on the show. <laughs> and I don't know. Uh, I don't know what we had uh, talked about. So you're going to remind me. <laughs> all right. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, uh, I'm Ugandan originally. I've lived in Toronto for about nine years. Okay. And I've been investing in both the U.S. and Canada for a bit. Okay. Um, I've been flipping full time for about two years now. Okay. Uh, but let's we can start all the way from the beginning, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I um, I started off doing rental arbitrage. Uh, that was in about 2015. So before like it was, Airbnb, yeah. So okay. that's when it was just picking up, and not many people were doing it. Um, so I would uh, rent some condos downtown, furnish them, and then put them right back, you know, uh, on Airbnb, sort of with like a master lease agreement. Okay. After that, um, we made enough money to buy those exact condos out, um, and uh, still keep doing the Airbnb. And then okay. we acquired some uh, long-term buy and holds, uh, semi-detached, uh, detached properties mm -hmm. as well around the city. And then um, I got interested in investing in the U.S. because uh, the issue was, uh, you know, how expensive Toronto can be. So scaling yeah. became an issue. And I figured, you know, instead of driving or flying to Alberta or somewhere cheaper, I could just literally drive two hours, you know, south and have a much cheaper, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're talking like New York State? Yep, so Buffalo, Niagara Falls, surrounding areas, Rochester, that kind so of thing. So you're in all that? Yeah, yeah. So, interesting, oh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this chat because yeah. those are, uh, those are interesting little markets. Mm -hmm. I had Andre Makovacek on here and he like mentioned he had looked at those, but then he ended up going even further. I forget the name of the town, but he went to a small town in Western New York State. Mm -hmm. um, it'll come to me, but uh so you ended up with these towns. Uh, give me the high level, how it works, you know, what you're into and why it works. Yeah, so I, uh, my niche was, uh, still is mobile homes in parks and mobile home parks. So you're buying the mobile homes themselves? Yeah. Yep. I'm now looking into buying the parks, but when I started out, it was the homes in the parks. Really? Yeah. And, so uh, you'll buy like I mean this is a big thing down there uh, because to get to get agency financing in the U.S. the park owners um, they're they can own more than what twenty five percent of the actual trailers mm -hmm. so um, there would be a, a big market for people looking to sell to somebody like you like exactly. if the if the actual end users couldn't buy it they'd want to sell it to a third party so that they didn't own it exactly and uh, it's there's not much competition there because there's this whole stereotype about mobile homes you know the not wanting to trailer. own them yeah yep um <laughs> i however, love trailer parks i think trailer parks are just about as good as it gets yeah i agree i, I love yep. them as well and that's because uh low cost to entry barrier low competition and uh the strategy that i'm using is because most parks don't want you to rent them out so what 
uh, we would do would be more of a own a finance type deal because again, they have trouble financing. Mm. Uh, mobile homes down there, right? So, so you're basically buying it and then offering, you're reselling it with a with a loan attached yep, to it. Yep. And you have a lawyer down there that just takes care of all that paperwork for you? No, I have my own agreements that I had uh, drafted up with a lawyer from before. Yeah. And it's pretty straightforward. Uh, since they're considered legally their motor vehicles, so mm -hmm. you you know the title and all that goes through the DMV. I oh, accept okay. it like in but New York But you register State. a lien on it? Exactly. Yeah. So I, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. um, but if they're older, like uh, older than 1990, mm -hmm. then you just uh, have an agreement, and then because there's course. no VIN on them if they're older than 1990, yeah, the serial number. So yeah, you just uh, have a notary take care of that. Oh, I love this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you have to you give it a number if it's older than that, or no, not necessarily. No, you just you just have, you describe it, get yeah, the notary to. They'll still have yeah. they'll still have a serial number, but you can't go to the DMV and have it you know changed. So. Is that primarily in like within an hour of the border that you're doing this? I'll say, yeah, an hour to two hours. Um, I've gone as far as Detroit, but you know, that's four hours one way. So I didn't really like doing that. Um, so I came back. To yeah, New I York don't State. blame you. So, so Niagara Falls, New York. Yeah, it's looking Lewiston, all the way as far as uh, Rochester. There's a deal we're looking at in Manchester, New York right now. Um, yeah, so I would say within an hour to two You'll hours. You'll go to Rochester. Stops. Yeah, Rochester's what, an hour in ish? That's an hour and a half, depending on yeah. on the snow and the drive. So you won't go all the way to Syracuse though? Only if the deal is really good. If so it's a great deal. If if I've yeah. got like, you know, a park that has let's say nine lots and they're willing to sell all of them to me and then I might, you know, because it'll be worth it to drive down there. So nine trailers you're talking about. No. If it's nine lots and I can bring in my own trailers if okay. I can bring in my own homes and put them on the pads, that that might be more worth it. Well, wouldn't they be do. renting because these these they can't piece out their their properties, right? They can't sell off nine lots on their trailer well, park, right? Because I I would be doing that. So depending on the size of the park, yeah, um, I would be able to bring in nine homes and nine different buyers because I'm I'm not the oh renter. you're saying you're selling off the trailers, yeah. yeah so so you'd be. So they'd still be renting from the from the park. From the park, that's yeah. Right. They, so you're they, you're basically rent. coming in saying I have homes that I'm going to sell to buyers. Now, mm -hmm. do you find the buyer first, or the buyer wants that trailer park and can't get qualified? Like, are you working with that trailer park saying, "Let me know who you're talking to that needs a, a trailer"? Depends. Uh, it yeah. goes both ways. Uh, I'll have my own list going um, of people who want mm -hmm. specific parks or they want specific home sizes. Mm -hmm. And then there's also parks that have a waiting list. They just either don't have the financing to bring in the homes themselves. Yeah. Or for whatever reason, you know, they're just exhausted and they're not on top of it. Well, so. I could see a lot of them. Yeah, they don't they don't maybe necessarily know how they're going to be able to um, sell them off and hold back the financing. I don't. Exactly. That's the other issue as well. Um, New York recently just uh, changed that. I, I believe it was 2019. Uh, they change the laws so unless you have a mortgage origination company then you know as a mobile home park you can't do the rent own model anymore so oh they can't do that no but you could sell it right away and hold that hold cash. back the loan you could you could do it cash um no but they can't sell it and hold back the loan on with the mv no so that's that's the issue it's a mm -hmm. the rent to own model is just it's, it's an issue there um and then on top so of so they need a third party like you exactly. in New York that's State. where i come in Interesting. Okay, so you're set, you're set, uh, settling a very specific need, and probably very early to the market. I mean, there's uh, there's got to be a few other people doing what you're doing. Yeah, but it's it's tough. I've been looking for people to network with, and for some yeah. reason, it's like they won't touch New York with a ten foot pole. So I and I say this all the time, but I feel like any market like that, where like oh no one wants to do that, I'm like that's a huge opportunity. Like people say St. Catharines is so tough, it's so hard to get anything done. I'm like huge opportunity. Anytime you're dealing with something that no one else wants to touch, all you have to do is become an expert in that, figure out the ways around the, the, the problems, and you're playing in a game with very few competitors. Exactly. Yep. I like this. So give me an example of a scenario where you were able to score a few or, you know, even if even if you want to just talk about one, mm -hmm. a trailer or a handful of trailers, like what are you paying? What are you picking up typically? Okay. So uh, I'll talk about my very first deal that I ever did because that was what got me hooked. Mm -hmm. uh, I was driving for dollars and, um, you know, most people, they don't put their 
This episode is brought to you by Control and Compound Financial. They teach real estate investors how to multiply their wealth using infinite banking strategies. For a complimentary wealth coaching session or to learn more, visit www.controlandcompound.com forward slash Andrew Hines. Hey guys, I just wanted to take a quick break from the episode and tell you about the investing in the U.S. mastermind for Canadians that both myself and Nick Van Dyke are hosting. It's happening on March 4th, 2023. And details for the event are available through the link in the show notes for this episode. So if you're watching on YouTube, it'll be in the description. If you're listening on one of the platforms, it'll be in the show notes. Alternatively, you can head to investinginthus.com for full information. My partner for the event, Nick Van Dyke, is sitting right beside me. So Nick, walk us through what's going to be happening at this event. We're going to be hosting a real estate uh, mastermind, mainly for Canadians investing in the U.S. You know, we're going to be talking about Airbnbs, short-term rentals, uh, you're going to talk about new constructions, self-storage, syndications. Yeah, uh, you know, and all our key contacts. Yeah, and even in addition to that, like, you know, just trying to simplify things in, you know, how to open up a bank account, legal structures, taxes, all that stuff. You know, it's going to be beneficial for obviously anyone who attends. And, uh, yeah. and then you also get to meet all those people who attend, people who are like-minded going into the U.S. And we're going to have an ongoing community that we're going to host on Facebook, a private group uh, where people can ask questions and interact. So if that sounds interesting, to you. We'd love to see you there. Please sign up for the event at investinginthus.com. We hope to see you there and thank you so much. Home on mm -hmm. Facebook or online or whatever. It's just a little sign in the window saying for sale. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted $6,000 for it. For a trailer? Yep. And, and you're driving for dollars on the other side of the border? Yep. Okay. So you're driven across to just find stuff to buy. Yep. Okay. Uh, I do that all the time now because yeah. that's where the deals are at. So they wanted six thousand. I negotiated it all the way down to three thousand two hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. And this was a three bedroom, two bath, uh, home, and uh, it it had you know it was in very good condition. The only issue was uh, the lady who owned it was a smoker, so there was a bit of you know, uh, stench stench issues there. But besides that, it was very well taken care of. New floors and everything. Um, so is this like a movable trailer or is this a trailer in a trailer park? That's like, it's not going anywhere. Majority of them don't ever move. Okay. So it, it's not movable. It's once it's set there, it's set. The only time like they weren't really designed probably, to be moved much, like they can move, but you could move them and, and there's deals to be made where you move them out of the park into another one or onto land. But most, I would say maybe 70% of mobile homes never yeah. move from where they're put but don't you just need like what is it, like a two two and a quarter inch ball on your your truck and you can pull them out of there yeah i mean but the electronics are like these aren't the type that are really moved around much like no. they're not the types that go to a seasonal camp no it, lo it looks just yeah. like a house you wouldn't yeah. be able to tell if you, you have to know, pull off like they all have the skirting siding. they yep. have skirtings on them they probably a lot of them have an addition of like a sunroom on exactly. them exactly and if you have like a double wide, that's a whole other thing. There's also triple wide. So depending on yeah, the size. Yeah, you're not moving those. That's Well, that's not going to be practical, exactly. right? Like you might as well just throw it away and, or bring in an excavator and throw it into a garbage bin. Exactly. That's so. Yeah. That's what they do. Um, they, they just they bring in an excavator and rip them apart. Yeah. Yep. Um, they also have uh, people who buy them and they'll take them away. Well, there is a salvage there, right? There is metal to be salvaged and somebody's going to want that. Like, mm -hmm. I'm sure you can get somebody to come take it away for free, exactly. even if it is. Some do end yeah. up paying as well. Pay to so, take it away. Yeah. So a little bit. Yeah. They'll, they'll pay for the, the scrap value. Yeah. We have a handful of trailers sitting on our site that qualify in that category. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So you bought that one for thirty two fifty. You happen to be driving for dollars. Were you driving in the trailer park? You just figured, yeah. hey, I'll just take a trip in. Yeah. That's, Don't what, these I, have that's what I do. Don't they have gates? Uh, it depends on the community. So there's a rural community, so they're not really gated. And even when they're gated, it's not a literal gate with a fob or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So depending on the state. Okay. So with New York, no, there's not many that are gated. Are gated. And you feel safe going into these places? Like yeah. what's what's the vibe in these? A lot of social assistance or is it a lot of just people who just couldn't afford anything depends. bigger? There's rankings, right? So you yeah. know, it's a one to five star ranking. Stay away from the one star parks. Obviously, that's mm -hmm. where you, you'll... You'll know right away when you see it, you know, a lot of trash, graffiti yeah. everywhere. You don't want to do a deal there anyways. Yeah. And then you've got five-star parks where homes can cost as much as, you know, half a million dollars. In a trailer park? Yes. Uh, and, you know, they have all the amenities. Is pool, that like one that you're going to? Are you going to those type In too? between. So yeah. I, I, I like the three to four-star, mm -hmm. two to four-star, depending on the size of the park and the area. Yeah. Um, that's what I like. Hard to imagine living in a trailer park this far north year-round. Like they got to have some pretty creative solutions for water to not freeze. See, that's the thing as well. You'd be surprised because yeah, they've got the 
pipes running underneath, but it's just like a house that wouldn't have a basement, right? Well, but I mean, you'll insulate your basement typically, even it, well, even if it's a crawl space, right? Mm -hmm. The way I would do it, you know, coming with a construction background, is I would I would spray foam all around the perimeter and heat that space right. underneath. Do they do that? Some of them do. Yeah. Some of them do. Others just use the. Um, it's like a coil you put on the water line to stop it from freezing. There's that as well. Yeah. Um, there's yeah, you're right. There's different creative ways that I've seen people do it. Some not so safe, but they can get away with it because again, tra uh, mobile homes are not subject to the same standards. Oh, uh, there's building no building codes. code. Yeah, and you just hook it up. <laughs> yeah, yep. yeah, so it's, it's, yeah, if anything, the DMV would regulate it. Right. Uh, okay, interesting. So you're you're finding stuff in the middle. So you drove through one of these. It was like a three-star park? Yeah. Okay, you found a three-star park. And who ranks those? How do you find that ranking? I, I just do it myself based okay. on my experience and looking these things. So this is your ranking in. system? Right. Um, I would say it's pretty much people within the industry would agree. Yeah. Uh, but there's no like set. Yeah. It's like people who say that's an A class rental or B class exactly. or C class. Yeah. It's like it's subjective at best. There is probably some general guidelines for it. Exactly. But uh, okay. So you drove through one of the ones you thought was middle of the road, looked reasonably clean. Mm -hmm. You found something with a, a note in the window with a number attached to it. Yep. You called them. And they said six, and you said what? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I'm here to make money. I'd like, you know, to have a fair deal between us. And so I negotiated all the way down to 30 to yeah. 50. The, the issue with a lot of these homes is mm -hmm. people are not living in them, but you still have to pay the lot rent every month. And yeah. so you'll find homes that people literally just want to give away. They would love to get some money back. Yeah. Like the reason that we got to that number, I was trying to get it lower, but she said, listen, I just put a new hot water tank in yeah. and some other stuff. And I would just like to recoup that investment. I said, perfect. So Okay, so she did a few renovations. You just gave her basically what she had in renovations yep. into it. And yep. she wasn't living there. No, she was moving in with her daughter. So this was an okay. old lady, 87 years old. She so was just trying in. to get rid of it. Yep. Okay, and until she can get rid of it, she keeps paying rent. And what are they paying on a monthly for rent there? It ranges from, I would say, 300 to seven to 800 a month. Okay, so very affordable. This is why I love trailer parks, because it's so affordable. Mm -hmm. Why I don't like them is what they might attract. Right. And so if you get the lower, the lower quality ones exactly. uh, and what you have to deal with. So that's a different discussion, which we'll get into. Mm -hmm. But okay, so you ended up purchasing that one for 3250. Mm -hmm. What was your process to find somebody to rent it or to buy it? You need somebody to buy it. Yeah. Uh, I have ads set up on all the platforms. So you're talking Craigslist, uh, Facebook Marketplace. There's a few. So not others. paid ads, but you're just saying trailer for no. sale, uh, seller financed. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I have two different systems that are, I'll have full on cash where I say it's for sale and this is the amount. And then I'll have another one where I'm willing to take payments on that and uh, have people come in. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had those two ads running and I had yeah. maybe about four or five people apply to the park because you mm -hmm. have to get park approved as well. Uh, just I have my own standards for making sure that. Yeah. So did you get park qualified. approved to buy it? Yes. I always have to get park approved. So yeah. I'll talk to the manager, let them know, like, this is what I do. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm an investor and I'm willing to come jump through whatever hurdles that you've got going on in your park. And uh, yeah. I'm improving the park as well. I'm not gonna stay in the home, but I'm gonna quickly renovate it, bring it up to park standards, yeah. and then quickly resell it to a park approved buyer. Okay, and how much renovation, say for instance, on this deal, did you need to do? I didn't do anything on that deal. Yeah. Um, because it was already in good condition. However, renovations will run you anywhere from 3,000 all the way to 15 to 20,000, depending on. And where are you finding the people to do this work? Is it easy to find somebody who's? That's the toughest part. Uh, yeah. Of course, I'm not getting a contractor. I'm getting a handyman. Yeah. Uh, they're cheaper. However, they come with their own issues, right? Yeah, so. tons of issues. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say that that's probably the uh, a very large challenge and also that people have to know how to renovate trailers. Like it's different. There are systems, yeah. there's mechanicals that it just makes somebody who's used to working on houses scratch their head a bit. Yeah, I've got guidelines that I have. Mm -hmm. I try to make it as foolproof as possible. You know, I'll, I'll let them know ex the exact materials that I need them to go get or I'll grab them mm -hmm. myself. And uh, then I'll uh, walk them through what I need to do. And it's pretty simple because at the base of it, it's there's not much going on. It's just a base and you have subfloor, flooring, and then 
basic plumbing stuff. So it yeah. could get done. It's tough to mess up uh, if the person knows yeah. what they're doing. But yeah, you just need to happens. know like the little quirks of the sewage system and stuff. Like that's all yeah. very specific to trailers. Mm-hmm. You know, coming owning several myself with our company and and all that. So, um, okay, so you purchased for thirty two fifty, and how did how did it play out from there? So I found a few people who were interested. So most of them didn't get PAC approved. Then I found this gentleman, and uh, he paid me fifteen thousand dollars for it. Fifteen. So now, really, like the lady who sold it to you, all she really did wrong was not putting it in Facebook Marketplace. Exactly. Like, yeah. Um, and also, I mean, some people just, you know, she was living there. She didn't want a bunch of people walking into her home. Yeah. And then not getting approved and whatnot. So she was a little bit adamant as well on that. Mm-hmm. Um, however, so I, I sold it to that gentleman and I sold it uh, on payments. So he gave me back a down payment of uh, uh, five thousand dollars. So right away I made. Uh, yeah profit on that and then yeah. uh, we negotiated a price of uh, $550 above uh, the um, lot rent. So okay. lot rent uh, at the time I think was 350 to $400. Yeah. So 550 so it was about 8 850 to 850 uh, to 880 that he was paying me but he would pay the lot rent himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, directly to the park and then just sending yeah. the straight cash flow. Yeah. Um, but something unfortunate happened, which was COVID, and then he passed away as well. Oh, really? And then I couldn't drive across the border because remember they closed the border around that yeah. time. And so I couldn't drive and I had to figure out how to now sell it, get it cleaned all remotely. Yeah. And that was quite the challenge because... Because you took back ownership of it. Yeah, his his kids called me and let me know because I, I couldn't get a hold of him and I thought it was a bit odd and found out, unfortunately, he'd passed away. Okay. And, of course, there was a back lot rent that was owed um, to the park. And they made you responsible for it? Yeah, uh, because even with the lien still being on there and me taking back possession... That you was, had to clear their lien? Right, because yeah. the other way they would clear the lien is sell the home to somebody else and, you know, keep mm-hmm. the... Uh, yeah, so they knew you still had a lien on it. and, and Right, so um, we worked it out. I found another buyer this time. I, I didn't want any payments. So I'm just like, I'm going to take cash for it. And I sold it again for 15 um, and then um, paid the lot rent, the back lot rent, and then kept, kept the difference. How much that. back rent was there? I think it was it was a few months, so, so not a thousand much, a couple thousand bucks. or so. However, the other thing I had done out of desperation, which I shouldn't have done, was I hired a uh, a realtor to try and get it sold. And of course, he didn't do much. Um, you had to pay him? Yeah, because yeah, I still had to pay his his fee on that. Um, so, but I still made a good good enough profit, so I was happy with that. But that was a good like learning experience since it was yeah. the first one. So it kind of seems like you second guessed your uh, your method. Yeah, because. Well, it was probably because of the lockdowns and stuff and not being able to cross the border all yeah, had an the effect. The frustration, because I, I literally drove all the way down to mm-hmm. the border and they turned me away. I was not happy about that. Like even showing them this is what it is. And they were like, yeah, no, you, sorry. And it's kind of... It, they had, but you could have taken the helicopter across at that point. Yeah. It's so stupid. Yeah. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and I, I did think about that. And when I saw the price, I'm like, it's going to eat too much into my profits for this one deal. So... I'm just going to wait. And so yeah. out of desperation, that's why I was trying to find anybody who could get it yeah. done. And even getting cleaners to come in, like I had crazy neighbors for some reason. They would tell everybody who came there, like the guy died from COVID and he was like in the home for a few days, which wasn't true at all. He died in hospital yeah. and it had nothing to do with COVID. But all the cleaners would come there and they would run away because nobody knew what COVID was at the time. And yeah. so I finally found one and she came with like hazmat suits and everything, mm-hmm. cleaned it up. But... Yeah, it was quite an interesting ordeal. Wow. So how many like months of rent did you collect before this happened? Five. Five months of rent and then he, and then he stopped paying. And, yeah. And how was he paying? He would send me PayPal. PayPal? Yeah. Okay. I hadn't set up any accounts in the States at the time. So So he's still sending over to, you know, US dollars, but you're cashing them Canadian. Exactly. Interesting. Okay. So at that time you hadn't set up any companies or anything like that? No. I feel like a lot of people do do that. Yeah, you know, they're just close one in their name mm-hmm. to start get going so you sort of proved the concept there but did you keep like keep going immediately like at what point did you decide 
to do another? Like, how long did it take you to sell it first off after you took it back? I would say maybe two, three weeks. Because two, three weeks from the from when you legally took it back? Yeah. And did you have to tell the DMV that you're taking it back? Like, what did you have to no, do? No, because it's older than 1990. Oh, so it wasn't so, even with the DMV? Yeah, so okay. it's just a notary. Um, yeah. yeah, and the, the issue that comes in is with the park approving people mm-hmm. to to now buy it from you that's yeah. that's the slowest part of the process but there's always people willing to come in and, and take buy. a look and apply and buy so so you just had to get them in so eventually that you found somebody so it only took a few weeks yeah so you got a clean few weeks listed and then it closed quickly yeah like when they decided how long did it take three days three days and you got a cash payout yeah so somebody willing to pay 15. So did you have a good gauge on that? Like you had looked at some comparables and knew that this lady was way under and... Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, you, you always have comps within the park itself. Mm-hmm. And the other comps that I use are actual apartments mm. that are for rent because I'm trying to get in people who can afford a typical rent, but they also yeah. have a bit of a down payment and they can afford mm-hmm. to buy their own home with that. So those are the kind of comps that I use. So when you say you're looking at multifamily, you're just looking at the comps for a rent standpoint. Like if they were going to pay nine hundred or a thousand a month to rent an apartment, they could pay that nine hundred or a thousand between renting the lot and paying you for the payment. Exactly. And it's a is that a blended payment that you were doing? Like is it interest and and uh, amortization, or was that just like what interest rate were you charging? Yeah. Your- so the way I do it is uh, instead of having like a percentage, I try to make it uh, quite simple for them as well. So I'll calculate maybe 15, 20%, mm-hmm. and then I just give them a final number. So if I would have taken, let's say 10,000 cash, if they wanna give me payments, yeah. then I'll ask for 12, five to 15. Oh, okay, so your number is just, you just pay more. Yeah, and that then, way they and then know no this interest. is the number. So everything you're paying is directly paying down what you owe. Exactly. And no interest. The only negative with that is if they stop paying or miss a bunch of payments, there's no recourse on them. Mm-hmm. But that's I mean, why it's very important to um, make sure the people you're approving have done, you've done your homework. And how, what would your due diligence be on the people you're approving? Um, so obviously uh, run a background check, make sure that, you know, not criminals, not recent, recent felons and that sort of thing. You'll take a felon, just not a recent one? Yeah. So how, how long ago does the that The guy I took was actually a felon. Um, and he was, this happened when he was like in his 20s and now he's in his 70s, so. Oh, no problem with right. that. Um, job history, uh, credit. Now, again, credit, you don't have to have amazing credit. However, you have to have demonstrated the ability to try and fix it. Yeah. Um, so if you've got all these people hunting you down, I'm not taking you. However, mm-hmm. if you went through some tough times and you messed up your credit and you're trying to fix it back up then, I can work. Yeah, if there's a story like there, sort of like the rent to own story exactly. you're looking for, yeah. somebody who had, you know, the common one is like an illness in the family, yep. they had to drop everything, a divorce, those are situations that, you know, mess up people's credits. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're looking for those types. And do you have, like, when they come to you, do you have like a question or a couple questions that you pre screen them with? Yeah, so yeah. I have a, um, uh, a sheet and I have a, it's an online form as well that they have to fill out. Uh, that has all those questions Mm -hmm. and the information that I need. And then I kind of uh, double check that with people back uh, across the border. Okay. And And, and it's sort of a double screening again, because they also not just have to qualify with me, but they also have to qualify with the park. The park. The park's checking the same type of things. So where do you pull your background checks? Is there an online? Yeah. Um, There is uh, uh, the New York one. I'm forgetting the name of it. Uh, And I think it's about, I think, $12. 15 to, to pull someone's uh, background mm-hmm. history. It's interesting how available information is down yeah, there yeah. and not crazy prices for it. And yet it's still very much way more open for business than Canada. Mm-hmm. Even even I think in New York, which is very, very leftist state. Exactly. No, that's... Not in the rural, er- rural er- areas though, right? Like not as bad in like Buffalo and, and Niagara Falls as, as it would be in like NYC. Yeah, and that's that's the other thing too because it doesn't feel that way when you're up north. Mm-hmm. Uh, people are very much, you know, 
almost the opposite. Reasonable still nicer, people. but yeah, you know. Yeah, it's uh, I've driven through so many times, and of course, you're gonna see some rough stuff. You're gonna see houses that are like crooked mm -hmm. and you know falling over, and a lot of weird stuff. There's a lot of obviously poor people in northern New York uh, State, so. Um, but of course there's an opportunity for somebody like you to come in and you know provide a good solution that that's you know clean and uh reasonable for uh for them I, i'm imagining what you're selling is like the parks are on board with it they like it's it's fitting with the general theme of the park yep so yeah depending on on, on the level at which the park is like i mentioned so these parks that i've dealt with where homes range from 120 to 220 thousand and these are double wide four bed, three yeah. bath type homes, and uh, you've got retirees in mm -hmm. there, or you've got people. There's there's a whole other sub genre of people who've grown up in parks and they'll mm -hmm. always live in parks regardless of yeah. how much money they make. That's yeah. just a community like they've lived in and it's what they're comfortable with. Yeah. So you've got that type of person as well. Yeah, they're just gonna do it. And they that's always what always want done. that, or you've got people who are doing very well in life and they're now just downsizing but yeah. they don't want all the stuff that comes with having a detached home anymore. Yeah. Uh, so they get the best of both worlds because you're in a community yeah. uh, and you don't have to do your own lawn care. and So the park cuts and, all the lawn and everything. Right. So you can, hi it, again, depending on what type of park it is, some you do it yourself, others you don't. So, mm -hmm. and the amenities and that sort of thing. So you've got a bunch of different people looking for different things at different price points. Yeah. How many are you typically doing in a year? So the first year I started, I did three, and then I kind of stopped, and I came back to Toronto and did uh, flips full time on this side. Okay. And now I'm going back, and I'm looking at. Currently, I started doing this again heavily about a month, mm -hmm. two months ago, and I've got four under contract right now. So. Okay. Do you already own them or just under contract? No, under contract. The issue is uh, some of them you're going through probate and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. because of the holidays, people are very difficult to get a hold of. Mm -hmm. And now the holidays are just done. So I'm hoping to have those moving by towards the end of this month. We should be good. Okay. And what's the typical price point you're buying at now? So homes have actually gone up a lot. Which this is type of housing? Yeah. yeah. Because uh, with the interest rates going crazy, uh, people who had like a down payment for a detached house can't afford yeah. it anymore. Now they're looking at this solution. Um, yeah. So we're looking at the cheapest that I've got is 6,000 mm -hmm. and uh, all the way up to 27,000. But I will sell those again from 24,000 all the way up to 80. Okay. Yeah. So what are you typically trying? Like, I guess you're just trying to get it for the lowest possible. Yep. But, uh, so give me an example, the $6,000 one, mm -hmm. where you found it, how you found it. And, uh, I had a park manager call me for that one. How did you know to call you? So these you, are people that I've worked with and they you've like, you've already done I, a deal in the park right, before. And, and she okay. liked what I do. And she gave me a call and say, Hey, we've got a few of these coming up. Are you interested? Mm -hmm. Sure. I'll take them. Right. So, uh, that one is a full gut and I'm looking to spend about. 14, 15,000 max for that. And I should be able to sell it for about 25 to 27. And how many square feet would this thing be? So it's a 72 by 14 uh, foot. So, and it's That's a big. three, this one is a three bedroom, one bath. However, I might convert it to a two, like a big two bedroom, mm -hmm. one bath. That way um, you get people who want more space. They're willing to pay some, for something mm -hmm. nicer than three tiny bedrooms. And you can renovate that much space for, for that much money? Yep, because uh, again, you know, you're not buying the top of the line stuff like the bath, the bathtub, for example, you know, it's it's not the new style tub you're putting in there. Um, it's the one with like the plastic, you know, instead of having actual ceramic tile mm -hmm. going around you just have like the plastic yeah that's very common with stuff. trailers because the weight yeah not a lot of you won't really find tiles in trailers because it's so heavy yeah and, um, and even for the tile on the floor you're, you're using the stick on one stick on one to yeah ceramic. but that's still got a cost you know you're still like a buck or two a square foot on that stuff too yeah and 
the other thing too is uh the standard of having it done you'll find people and and for me i found the best way to do it is kind of leave some things not done mm-hmm. because people would rather have a discount on that and bring in their own stuff so like appliances for example i'm not completely out yeah. it because okay. the market is fine with just everybody owning supply their, their own, own yeah. stuff so that's how it comes down as well okay so you don't do that so you're doing things like floor paint mm-hmm. uh kitchen like new kitchen yeah and even with kitchen i'm not buying brand new cabinets i'm just sourcing used or fairly yeah. used and painting them putting new can you put in bundle. standard like house cabinets yeah. that that'll fit because mm-hmm. that's the only thing with some trailers is like you have to do like a smaller like a compact type yeah. and then i'm not i'm not putting in uh you know quartz countertops or anything like that no, right? it's too so, heavy <laughs> they're just regular countertops so that's the kind of thing and then for the bathroom you're, you're doing the tub toilet shower mm-hmm. and um bedrooms is just flooring paint like are you flooring the drywall paint. stays on are you redoing electrical are you redoing any plumbing or is that no so i stay away from stuff where it needs like a full gut and that type of mm-hmm. situation um so electrical stays the same i'm only just uh updating the fixtures okay yeah. updating the fixtures all right so you've got a fairly good gauge at what needs to be done after you've done this many. yeah yeah i've, I've got a, a checklist and plus doing the home flips as well i brought in that you know style Mm -hmm. um from the trailer homes you keep calling people don't like calling them trailers they like calling them mobile homes okay um yeah so from the mobile home stuff yeah cutting those kind of corners into flips worked worked out really well for me and vice versa as well so you pulled some of the things you learn back Yeah, yeah yeah there are ways to do things cheap and so many people just focus on well I don't want to spend the time. So, uh, but there is a delicate balance needed. So it's cool. You can bring some of that back here. Like, so you're renovating, you're flipping Toronto houses, like in Toronto proper. Yes. Yes. Uh, what kind of houses? Detached, semi-detached. So you're getting into like million plus purchase price. Correct. Are you still doing that now? No, no not doing that. I, I'm, I'm interested in doing if there's some creative aspect to it. So mm-hmm. then to take backs or lease backs there's obviously a number that it makes sense right like there's always a number i feel like today and i just had uh two people on that were uh there are are flipping in toronto they're kind of coming back to it Mm -hmm. and they used to do you know 75 percent of um after repair value Mm -hmm. less whatever the renovation cost is that's sort of the magic number and lots of people talk in that ballpark for me i feel like it's gotta be lower these days it has to be and it's it's pretty tough because that's when i started out i was doing the same exact thing but then you had the market explode and it was almost impossible to find that deal because there's always somebody willing to do it for less so i kind of had to like throw mm-hmm. those numbers aside and use rough estimates yeah. but now it's it's very important to hit that number and a little bit lower yeah so i'm looking at 70. okay uh i'm willing to go up higher if uh again there's a creative aspect so if i don't have to pay like the um mm-hmm. the interest rate from the lender the hard money lender or the private money mm-hmm. because i'm doing a lease back from the owner then those numbers are much better and then i'm also i'm also not paying like you know the huge closing costs to transfer title mm-hmm. and pay the land transfer tax that brings my number down so i could still do that but the issue is finding people mm-hmm. who are knowledgeable enough the sellers will knowledgeable enough to want to do that type of yeah so i looked around for a little bit but it was very tough to find that i'm still open to it if it's Mm -hmm. there but that's why i'm back down to the states now so you're not doing any active like wholesale lead generation in toronto in toronto no because i have were you at one point were you generating your own leads or were you just going on on market yeah i have wholesalers i have a list of wholesalers yeah stuff um probably the common ones we we know yeah. yeah okay so that's how you're finding your deals. And how often or how many were you doing in Toronto? I did about seven mm-hmm. in a year and a half. Wow. So that's um, a lot of capital. So you were borrowing a lot of private money. Love, I had my own yeah. because I liquidated uh, all my inventory uh, during 2019. I was very lucky. Okay. Um, and so I had capital seating and you, you had out. rental properties you liquidated yeah okay. yeah so the condos the detached so okay. sold all that stuff right in time um 
because I was I was worried. I I thought something was coming. I had no idea it was COVID. Nobody did, mm. but I just figured you know the ten the ten year rule with the cycle. So I was yeah. like you know we're going very hot. Twenty seventeen was a little bit of a shake there. Yeah, yeah, but. But you know, nothing in the grand scheme of things. Right. It would pop right back up. So 2019, 2020, I, I sold mm -hmm. things and I was lucky it did very well. Mm -hmm. um, so I started flipping full time. Okay. What were you doing for work before that? Uh, I was an art director. So okay. graphic design, web design, that sort of stuff. Uh, I, I, I led uh, the marketing uh, department for a wholesaler that does beads and mm -hmm. jewelry, the largest in Canada. Um, that was an interesting job I liked. Yeah. Very cool. It's, it's interesting to hear how people have like different paths and different backgrounds and end up doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. Nice to see how they compliment too. I had another guy who was in like film and, um, he came on and he was just talking about how like they would produce, you know, uh, theater and you had to do it on next to nothing. Like you had to like scrap stuff together to build your sets and stuff. Mm -hmm. And he would apply that into what he, uh, what he did in his flips and it was rentals yeah and no, uh, the creativity and the problem solving mm -hmm. that's my advantage um i because you always have to solve problems when you're in the yeah. field that i was in and be creative so well you get on a call with these people selling these trailers for instance mm -hmm. i mean it's probably not too hard to talk about hey like I'm a businessman. This is what I do. I do buy these. I do make a profit from them, but I can be, you know, I'm a reliable buyer. I can buy it and, you know, you can be done with it. I think that's probably appealing to a lot of them. Yep. Um, so do you find a lot of buyer resist or seller resistance or do you, do you generally find they're saying, well, how much will you give me? And I mean, these are people who have posted signs in their windows usually. Yeah. Or they're, they're known. Depends on their motivation mm -hmm. um, and the time at which. So if you find somebody who's just, literally posted the sign today, mm -hmm. it's gonna to be tougher to get a deal with them because their motivation is not that high. They haven't had enough time to. Right, yeah. as opposed to somebody where it's been sitting for, you know, three, mm -hmm. four weeks and, and nobody's taken it. Not even a call, willing. yeah. Um, and then you've got people who just inherited it, for example, mm -hmm. and so they have no idea what it's worth. They just know that it's worth something those can go well or they could go very badly because some of them will be like really delusional. Like, you know, oh yeah, I want a hundred grand for this. I mean, and you're probably going through this right now on some of these, like the yeah. probate stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or you have family members fighting in between. Oh yeah, yeah. And I found myself in one of those situations. So I was negotiating uh, an off market and it was like a family, like I was talking to the one daughter and there were like three others involved and ultimately it all fell apart because they had like i i think i had a decent price lined up but uh you know you get the rest of the family involved and all of a sudden that goes away yeah yeah that's uh that's no fun but uh okay so you're involved in this now some of these like probate can take a long time can't it it does so how long are you looking at to, to close these three four months depending on mm -hmm. but then again it also has to do with the uh the family members and some of them are very difficult to get a hold of. But have they not already agreed yes. the price? They have. Yes. So whoever was the trustee has already agreed to sell. So that's done. It's just a matter of going through, going the, through the process. Yeah. Whatever's involved. I'm not even that familiar with what's involved in that process. Mm -hmm. Okay. So these ones, you have the one you said that's going to be a 6,000 purchase and uh, up to 27,000 sale. 20, 24 to 26, 27. Yeah. It's not a huge margin if you're 14 in, so you're going to be like 19 into it. Yeah. So, I mean, if I can do 10 profit, I, I, these are not ideal for me, but it's mm -hmm. very safe. I know I'm always going to get yeah. my money back and I'm going to get it fairly yeah. quickly. I'm still negotiating that. I want to bring it much lower, but mm -hmm. sometimes to keep your leads coming in, you have to work with numbers that are not Yeah, ideal. you gotta keep the keep things moving so that you keep new leads coming in, right? Get Especially with park managers, yeah. I have like that one, I'll take it simply because Keeps I want them to keep going. Bring, bringing me the good stuff as well. Right? Yeah, so, yeah. so then you had another one that you said it might even go up for 80? Yeah, and uh, they want 24 for that one, but I can definitely negotiate lower. So okay. I, I got the letter of intent in, and, but a lot of the stuff is done verbally, right? It's like a back and forth thing. 
Um, so you have, you gave them a letter of intent. Like, who taught you this stuff? Like, how do you know their their customs, practices, and procedures for this type of thing? I, I study a lot. I, I, <laughs> I've done a ton of, like, YouTube. YouTube is the best university So YouTube, the so there's people who show, talk about doing this on yeah, YouTube. And, uh, yeah, and I, I, I did a course specifically for mobile homes yeah. uh, by a guy named John Federal. He's, like, the master of this kind of stuff. Um, and, yeah, taught me a lot of stuff. Very cool. And you know, even with people teaching courses on it, you don't find it too saturated. You're not competing too much. I guess it's all relationships. If you're the guy that that picks up the phone and says, "Yeah, I'll take those," then yeah, and yeah. also depending on the market you're in, right? I mean, I'm in northern upstate New York. Nobody's doing that investment stuff. Not many people are doing it, at least. Right? Yeah, a lot of people are just put off by those areas. They don't, you know, it's not. From an investor standpoint, not the most attractive. New York State in mm -hmm. general has has some people a little scared. Yeah. Uh, but I've also heard the flip side that New York State can be great even for a real estate investor, you know, just not New York City. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, but some of the rules apply statewide, yeah. which kind of makes it difficult. So you just have to be more careful about your yeah. tenant and buyer, you know, selection right. process. Okay, so are you doing other things in the states, or is it the trailers? Yeah, uh, I'm. I'm looking at uh, Florida right now, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm looking to do a lot of subject to stuff, so create creative finance or seller finance deals for detached homes. Mm -hmm. I was very interested in the commercial space, so multifamily and that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. Kind of slowed that down right now mm -hmm. because we're in this transitionary period. I'm just gonna give it maybe till middle of the year, and then mm -hmm. I'll ramp that back up. But I've been uh, throwing out offers for detached homes uh, with seller finance involved. And what uh, what areas are you targeting? Uh, so Miami Dade, uh, Fort Lauderdale, and then I'm looking at Orlando area as well. I'm not too familiar, so I'm just more running my comps and talking mm -hmm. to some people who are there already. Um, they're mm -hmm. helping me out. I've got like a couple of agents that I'm talking to, but. Yeah, so I'm interested in Orlando and uh, Miami-Dade area. Okay, and how often, like, what's your procedure for, because you're full-time at this, right? Yeah. Like, a lot of people, you know, they work a job, so they have their limited hours and they get a lot done. How do you structure your days? Like, what do you set as priorities? What do you set as goals? Mm -hmm. And how do you arrive at your level of production? So that's been something that I've been trying to change up and ramp up because... Mm -hmm. The last year has been a little bit slower because I've been doing a lot more uh, deal analysis, but not mm -hmm. a lot of uh, closing has happened. Mm -hmm. So I've decided now I'm just going to 10 times what I've been doing. And mm -hmm. so that's, you know, call a lot more people, uh, follow up. Uh, and then it's always changing because now once you have like, mm -hmm something on a contract then you're in this other stage which is like the renovations and mm -hmm. managing the contractors so that's always changing but when it's like a slow time like this where i'm just doing acquisitions it's more so having mm -hmm. you know the daily routines which might get boring which is like the cold calling running different yeah. analysis and uh do you block off certain times of the day? This is for analysis. This is for cold calls. Do you set a goal? Call X number of people each day? Right, right. That's what I'm trying to do right mm -hmm. now. I'm trying to get in at least uh, by the end of the week. I want to make at least five offers. And five offers on properties anywhere in the States or pretty much anywhere? So Florida and New York. Okay. Um, and with New York, it's strictly mobile homes. Yeah. Uh, Florida, it's both. Uh in your legal ent entities, are you still buying in your personal name, or are you buying? No, I've I've got I've like got an LP. Um, I've got LLC, so I have a Canadian corp that owns my okay US corp and that sort of thing. Right. Okay. So you're registered in Florida, or was no, it formed so, in Florida, or for formed in New York State? No, I've got I've got it in um, Michigan. So because I was looking at Michigan yeah, at okay. one point, and I had that formed, so I'm gonna talk to my um, yeah uh, accountant there to see what makes sense if I should keep running it through that one or have a mm -hmm. Florida one done. Yeah, I'm wondering what the implications of, of that are because now you have two states involved in your income. Like, mm -hmm. so you're gonna pay the higher tax, I guess, of whichever one. Right, I haven't got to that stage. I, <laughs> I figure I'll solve that problem when it when it comes. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, like you can adjust and, and you know, make money anyway, right? Me, like sometimes it's all about 
making sure at least you're yeah. making the deals happen, right? Right. I mean, my first go at the States, I formed the wrong type of, uh, of entity. I, I formed an LLC, LLP instead of an LP because I'm mm -hmm. like, I want limited liability, but I knew nothing. It was, it was a long time ago. Um, I kind of learned my lesson, but uh, yeah, I had to change it. I mean, in that case, I was pretty easy to fix, but mm -hmm. uh, you definitely need to uh, dot your I's and cross your T's, but at the same time, you need to get moving. So yeah, it's cool that you're uh, you're doing that. So you've got a lot of irons in the fire. It's really just about time management. What's your goal with all this? I mean, obviously you've you know you've quit working in a career and you're you've made this your career. Mm -hmm. um, have you set a number? Like, what are you trying to accomplish? Ideally, I want to get into the commercial side of things. That's always been my goal. Uh, I don't have a number per se. Uh, because that's always going to change. You know, once you get to one, you're going to hit, mm -hmm. you're going to have another goal. So for me, it's to eventually have it to a point where I have a lot more time freedom mm -hmm. to do the things that I like, like travel and learn other things. Mm -hmm. um, and for the last year, it seemed that way. But w when you hit certain goals, it's very important to never get complacent and mm -hmm. always try and move forward so i always try and set up so getting into the commercial real estate side of things is really what mm -hmm. i'm looking to get into now okay and and when you say commercial real estate are you talking multifamily uh retail office space storage like what multifamily uh storage and mobile home parks oh so you want to own the parks yeah and you could even do a creative little strategy where you buy the park I don't know if you sell, I don't know if they'll let you do this for agency loan. Like if they'll let you sell it to a related company that you I'm, own. I'm not, I'm not too sure. So I'm, yeah. but I've been looking into, again, the seller finance type of deals or having yeah. innovation agreements and that sort of thing. So right before interest rates started going up, I was looking closely at a deal for four trailer parks, mobile home parks in uh, Georgia. And, uh, it was going to have to be one of those sell-offs. We would have to approach individual um, renters and offer them, hey, how would you like to own this? Mm -hmm. And then basically do something, you know, maybe close to zero down. And then it end up, ends up working similar for them. Maybe they pay a bit more, but they're going to own it. And uh, I was looking at doing that. Glad I didn't pull the trigger then. But then again, maybe, I mean, the prices on the, that stuff, for sure cap rates are, are going up. So, so those properties in general to, are, are going to come down to touch, but I still think they're going to do fantastic. Like the rents are going to go up mm -hmm. as you've pointed out, like it's a more affordable place. It's one of the most affordable things you could live in. Mm -hmm. So that's going to do very well in a recession, which I mean, I've just been saying we are in one, I guess, technically Canada hasn't actually been, but, yep. uh, in my mind, we are. And uh, obviously going into that this year, um, it's an inevitability with with all the rate hikes. Right. That, so that's what I'm waiting on. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, commercial is always a step behind mm -hmm. the residential stuff. So you'll feel it with the residential deals before yeah. you feel it in the commercial side of things. For sure. I mean, but offsetting that is that rents are so high, so much further up because mm -hmm. because buyers are afraid. People are afraid to buy, so they become renters. And they've driven rent up. Like London's been insane. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard that U.S. some markets are even even more insane. The rent the rental increase, and I'd be curious what these parks have done. You know how it's changed from last February to now, and you know have they increased their rates by twenty five percent, fifty percent? They've for sure increased. Uh, I know for two of them, it's been about 15%. 15 percent. Fifteen now. Yeah. However, it, it's very tough given that this is New York, so you've got limitations on mm -hmm. how much you can do it, and there've been uh, a lot of stuff going on. So even if there's years. turnover, there's still limitation on how much they can inc increase rent. I'm not too sure on yeah. that. Um, no, I don't. I don't want to say the wrong thing, but. I believe you you could do it if there's a turnover, mm -hmm. but the issue is getting the turnovers, just, right? So yeah, um, yeah. So they, they've they've increased that. However, with that as well, you've got a lot more people not paying, mm -hmm. so they're going through that. So people not paying rent, which means these parks are going to lean their their homes, their their uh, mobile homes, mm -hmm. and then eventually end up taking them back 
potentially and then selling them reselling them right and is it like a power of sale or is it more of a foreclosure where they just take it back and and the the former owner of that trailer gets nothing yeah it's a it's a foreclosure so uh, just foreclose so if they don't pay they're losing their home yeah. and they don't get anything out of it yeah and uh that the the on the other side of things is mm -hmm. you've got a lot of people on the waiting list who mm -hmm. want to rent so yeah it, it's just going through the process because yeah. it's not very landlord friendly in new york yeah um but once you get the person out you've got a yeah. ton of people waiting so yeah it's not landlord friendly but it's close you can go to it quickly mm -hmm. um okay so have you ended up buying a couple of foreclosures like they were they were foreclosed on by the parks and then sold off have you no I, yet? I haven't i haven't done that before because again they always have a waiting list so yeah. they'll sell those for retail i'm looking to buy stuff way below retail oh okay so if they actually do take possession of it they're gonna yeah, sell it for there's full no pop. there's no reason for them to really sell it below if they, do they ever the connect you with somebody who's missing payments and just say work something out with them yes and no because they're yeah. looking as well they're trying to recoup what they one, well, obviously, and, in that process, you got to square up with them too, right? And the, yeah. the issue is, I'm I'm a little bit hesitant to deal with those kinds of sellers mm -hmm. as well because they could get cheeky with you, right? So they, they they could pull a fast one where, especially if it's an older one and you have to go through the notary, there's many things that they can do to try and mess around with it. So I try and get the clean. Title you want something that actually title. has a VIN, has a title, because I've heard here you can you can request a, a VIN for something that doesn't. So something really old like that, that didn't have it, mm -hmm. you could request no, they, it. No, they, they always have the uh, the serial number. It's just more so going into the DMV and it being recognized. Oh, okay. So if it's old and then a certain age, they won't even recognize it. Interesting. It obviously works a little bit different. You've obviously done your homework on this. Mm -hmm. um, okay, very cool. Anything else you wanted to share today that I haven't asked you about? Mm. Not really. I just more. Yeah. Again, I'm doing a lot more of the creative finance stuff mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the single family homes. And is that through uh, realtors that you're you're calling up, or are you trying to solicit off markets? How? What's your approach for that? Both. I've got some wholesalers who work specifically with that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and then there's also like people who are uh, selling on market with a realtor but the home is just sitting there. So they're like in negative equity at the moment and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So I've uh, sent out a few uh, different offers for seller finance and some are interested. Some are just a bit unrealistic. So we're still- are you, You're flyering, out. are you? No. no, no flyering yet. So just phone calls basically, searching in phone calls. Yeah, at the end of the day, creative. if you're doing creative problem solving, it's not something they hear every day. So you're bound to get people if you just stay consistent with it. It's just about how many calls do you need to make. People always say it just comes down to a number. Like, especially exactly. people in sales, like you, you know, for every hundred calls I make, I'm going to get X number of leads and out of the leads, I'll get X number of, um, of, you know, if it's a realtor buyer clients or seller clients and then X number of sales. For me, I yeah. found the number is four. So for every four, uh, offers that I make, you get one, I'm going to get one, but okay that number goes lower when you're talking creative finance. Yeah. Um, and so that's not even talking about how many I have to analyze before I'm even interested in making an offer. Okay. Yeah. So you're analyzing how many properties do you think for every one that you get? Analyzing, I'd say perhaps 15 to 25. Okay. It's not that, that terribly much, right? It just requires effort and consistency. Yeah. Yeah, as so many things do. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. it can get a bit repetitive and... Yeah, so what's the why then? Like for you, the why, I mean, obviously you said time freedom, travel, anything else? Like do you have family as well? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I'm single, but I've yeah. got my mother, my father, okay. and my siblings. Yeah, no kids yet then? No. Is that on the plan? <laughs> <sighs> Not yet. M maybe Not one yet. day? Yeah. Well, you got time to do all this stuff now then, so do it now. And get exactly. it done with. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Where can people reach you? Uh, I have my website, smartassetgroup.com, Instagram, smartassetgroup. You can okay. reach me there. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, thank you very much for making the, the trip down from Eastern Toronto. Yeah. I know how that can be and I don't envy your drive back. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me, Andrew. I appreciate it. All right. We'll stay in touch. Thank you.
Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. Please make sure to share this episode far and wide. Help it help more people. I really appreciate you tuning in. I'll see you on the next one. There are a lot of people out there talking about the infinite banking strategy and whether or not it makes sense for them. To find out what it's all about and if it's a fit for you, visit controlandcompound.com forward slash Andrew Hines, where my audience can gain exclusive access to books, podcasts, and webinars tailor-made for real estate investors. Are you interested in getting started in investing in the United States but not sure where to start? Why not attend the Investing in the U.S. Mastermind hosted by myself and Nick Van Dyke on March 4th, 2023. Nick and I will be covering topics ranging from A to Z, new construction, multifamily development, Airbnb, and much, much more, as well as the basics, including opening a bank account and understanding the proper corporate structure. We'll have several keynote speakers touching on very specific topics. And most importantly, you'll be sitting in a room with people who are highly focused and highly committed to investing in the United States. For more information, visit investinginthus.com and send me a DM on Instagram for a special discount code. I'll look forward to seeing you at the event.